down in the cross where my Savior died, and were for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name, there to my heart was the blood applied, Glory to His name. I am the one grossly saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There is the cross where He took me in. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. was the blood of God, glory to His name. Oh, precious thou the saints from sin, I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean, glory to His name, glory to His name, glory to His name. Was the blood of mine. Glory to his name. Come to the cloud that's so rich and sweet. Cast up our soul in the Savior's feet. Plunge it today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to was the blood of God. Glory to His name. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that we can be here on this wonderful afternoon, God. And I know there's people out there probably picnicking or bicycling or whatever, but I uh, never really want to be in any place on Sunday afternoon except in your house, worshiping uh, God of your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and singing His praises and preaching His Word. Help us tonight as we finish uh, this sermon on the judgment seat. And I pray that when that time comes around and we stand before the Lord uh, as Christians, uh, God will be able to uh, have our Master say, uh, Well done, now good and faithful servant. Uh, enter ye into the joy of the Lord. Help us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask or said? Can I doubt His tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? And with peace divine His comfort, here by faith when it is well. For I know what every call me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, here's each winding path I tread. Gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter, and my soul a thirst may be, Gushing from the rock before me, low a spring of joy I see. Gushing from the rock before me, low a spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, all the fullness of His love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit was immortal, when the light the rounds of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way.
Well, I, I'm finally glad to uh, get in the pulpit on a Sunday night. Uh, last Sunday, I'd had my COVID shot the, uh, the day before, and it made me sick as a dog. <laughs> and uh, as y'all know, I, 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 I couldn't make it. So y'all had services without me. Um, I, you know, I'm, 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 I'll be glad to get the second part of it done. Amen. Uh, but the Sunday before then, I preached the first half of a sermon about the judgment seat of Christ. And I knew it was going to take more than one Sunday to finish the sermon. Uh, because it's uh, a very important subject. And the Bible does have a few things to say about the judgment seat of Christ. And as Christians, it behooves us to know uh, what we're going to be participating in when we uh, get raptured out of this place. Um, as I've said before, that's probably the first thing you're going to know after death is you're going to wake up and we're going to be uh, flying through the air. And then you're going to stand before the Lord. Now, uh, there's an old song that uh, says, There'll be no dark valley when Jesus comes. And it talks about... A joyous meeting, amen, when Jesus comes. And for some people, they're going to be real glad to see the Lord when he comes. Then other folks, well, they haven't done so good in the Christian life. Uh, maybe they've done something else, or maybe their priorities have been somewhere else. Uh, but, uh, you know, they've got their fire insurance, and then they kind of sit down. And uh, they're going to have a rough time of it. And even some Christians that have uh, dedicated their life to the Lord, some, some of them have messed up and uh, gone astray. You know, things like that happen. Um, I hope that I can stand before the Lord and give a good account. Uh, I know there's many times that I've had to confess before the Lord uh, because I don't want to face those things at the judgment seat. Uh, now, just to review, 1 Corinthians Chapter number 3, verse number 9. And let's read the scriptures again tonight. Uh, and we'll find out what the Bible says about this day when we stand before our Savior. As the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be our Savior and our Judge on that day. Uh, verse number 9. Now this is a transition verse. He transitions from talking to uh, the people as... Uh, husbandmen and farmers to builders. It says, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another man buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Amen to that. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Heavenly Father, help us now as we finish studying this great concept, God, this great doctrine, this uh, something that's oh so important to us. The judgment seat of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, uh, by way of introduction, I pointed out to you that in Matthew 12, and this morning we quoted this preaching on the great uh, white throne judgment, uh, that every idle word which men shall speak uh, shall be brought out at the day of judgment. Jesus Christ himself uh, told us about that. And uh, the first week we looked at this, uh, I made a point in pointing out that this judgment seat is not about salvation. Now, when the lost uh, or 
whoever stands before the great white throne judgment, that judgment is for the salvation of one's soul. Whether they're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire, or they're going to spend eternity with the Lord, in the, uh, eternity in heaven, and uh, be among the saved and the blessed. Uh, this is not, this, we dealt with this when we, the day we were saved. Jesus Christ dealt with this on the cross of Calvary. We deal with, with our sin, every time we get down on our knees and we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In 1 John 1, 9. Uh, we are to labor for the Lord. We are to build our life upon the Lord. And yes, we are to build. Uh, there's an imperative here. Uh, Paul said, look, I laid the foundation of the church and, and the doctrines and put the thing out in the Bible. Now you Christian, whoever you are in the future, you're supposed to take what I've taught you and you're supposed to build on it. And then the next we looked at the rewards given for any and all kinds of works at the judgment seat of Christ. And uh, if, if you look at your um, little hand out there, uh, down about the... Uh, let's see, the, the back of the second page, uh, you'll see that the, the end of it came to the precious stone. Uh, it covered gold and silver. And we looked all those scriptures up and we, we studied those. And if you walk for the Lord and you work for the Lord and you try in your life to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, you will get all these wonderful, precious, marvelous things at the judgment seat of Christ as a reward. Not only does He save us, but He's... Uh, he pays us, amen, for working for him. Now, we may not get the pay now. Matter of fact, I don't know if I want the pay now. I'd rather have it then, amen? Uh, but then there's some other things that are involved. And tonight, this is where we're going to pick up. Uh, because every one of us, um, well, we have a problem. Let me take my coat off and, and you can see what the problem is. You see this stuff here? This is our problem, <laughs> It's this old body that we're trapped in. The inside of us is saved. Our soul and our spirit have been born again, saved, and we're headed for heaven. This outside stuff, well, God's going to have to give us a new one of them because it's never going to make the trip. I mean, either you're going to live long enough, they're going to stick you in a box and stick you in the ground, amen. Either that or they're going to... Uh, you're going to wait around one day and hear the voice and the trump and the uh, voice of the archangel and we're going to go sailing through the air to meet all our dead loved ones and meet Jesus in the air and then we're going to proceed to and uh, go where we've been talking about. And either you're going to have to give an account of those works done for the Lord uh, or else you're going to have to give the works that were done for the flesh, of the flesh, works of the flesh. Now, Let's look at Galatians chapter 5. They're on your sheet. In the middle of the first back page. Uh, it's B. Galatians 5.19. Now, there are several lists like this in the Bible. And they all have to do with the flesh. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest. That means they're made uh, visible to people. And yes, people can tell when you've sinned and when you haven't. Uh, which are these? Adultery. Fornication uncleanness, lasciviousness. Now these are all the, the, fleshy, the fleshy sins of lust. Then you've got idolatry, witchcraft, excuse me, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Now I want you to notice this grouping here, what's grouped with idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, that's all part and parcel of all this stuff. You want to know what's wrong with it? We talked about cancel culture this morning, uh, Brother Robinson. And, and uh, these people are full of hatred for everything except what they believe in. And, and uh, all that has, it has to do with all the variance. means you just can't get along with anybody. You're just vying for... Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's okay to uh, get out there and strive, but when you just uh, want to argue with everybody comes along, you just can't have any peace in your life. That's a sinful thing, and that, that the flesh gets that way. Emulations, that means a, a copycat. Some people have no original ideas and want to copy everything. Uh, then you have wrath. 
That means people, that, that, you know, folks that beat up other folks and hit folks and uh, do all kinds of meanness. Strife, that means you fight all the time. Seditions, that means you're sneaking around trying to uh, undo the authority figures because you want to be in charge, basically. Then you have heresies. Those are things that aren't right according to the scriptures. Then you have envyings, murders, the drunkenness, revelings. And such like. In other words, if he didn't mention any bad thing that people do, those two little words, such like, covers everything else. And you can use your imagination. Nowadays we have quite a few things. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time, time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, in 1 Corinthians 3... You've got gold, silver, precious stones, and then you have three more things on the list. Wood, hay, and stubble. Now, according to what the Bible says here, all these works are manifest in these substances, and they're going to be passed through some kind of holy fire up there at the judgment seat. And I don't know about you, but the last time I put wood in the fireplace... It burned up pretty good. And uh, if you really want to have a chimney fire, put you a bunch of hay <laughs> in your fireplace and light that on fire. Now, you, you'll burn the fireplace, you'll burn the fire. Uh, people will come, amen? Because you'll have fire coming out of your chimney. So how do you know that? Well, one day I put a, a basket made of straw in there to try to burn it up one March. I had the fire department out there, short order. Because the neighbors saw the fire coming out of the fireplace. I didn't mean to do I didn't know that do that. I do now. Do now. And then stubble. That's all. That, that even a decent hay. That's just all the leftovers. Boy, what a pitiful life. I mean, it's bad enough to have a life made of wooden work. And, uh, you know, uh, hay is uh, pretty bad. It's not much of a substance. But, boy, stubble is pretty poor. You, ever, you know what stubble is? Have you, have you little ones ever been to a barn where they had hay? All right, you got these stacks of hay, right? And then what's on the floor? There's little bitty pieces of, of hay that's kind of falling apart and broken apart. And then what else is there? There's like a dust on that floor. That's, that's even smaller pieces of that hay. A big wind come along, go through that barn, it'll blow that up, and you'll sneeze and sneeze and sneeze and sneeze. Even if you don't have hay fever. And don't light a fire when that wind comes through there, stirring up all that dust, it'll catch the barn on fire. So, you know, some people are going to, that gold's going to go through there, and it's going to melt, and it's going to purify, and that silver's going to go through there, and it's going to melt and purify. So what happens to the precious stones? It makes them harder and and better, when they want to improve off a gem, they'll, they'll put a fire treatment on it. But that wood, hay, and stubble, well, some people, let's just say this, they're going to have a big bonfire. <laughs> a big bonfire. Hebrews 9, 14 says this, How much more shall the blood of Christ, through the eternal Spirit, offer himself without spot, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You know what the trouble is with this flesh? Even when it does good, and the flesh can do good, it's dead. It's dead work. Look, there's trees growing out there in the yard. There's leaves, and springtime comes, and, and you know the blossoms and the and the and the fresh leaves come on there, and the uh, uh, you know on an apple tree, the apples start to to form on the thing, and, and and you know spring's a lovely time. But then you take that tree and you chop it down, like the one in my backyard that came down after Sally, and you chop it up, and you know what it sits there? It just sits there and decays. And pretty soon, it ain't got no moisture in it. And then pretty soon, the rot sets in. And if you let it sit there long enough, it ain't good for nothing. Well, you know, you can make a fire out of it if you get it chopped up in time, get it in the fireplace, or sell it to someone for firewood. Hay don't last a long time at all. Uh, they've got to be careful. You've, I'm sure you've seen uh, during hay time, 
you know, uh, in farm country. Uh, now they've got these big uh, things that roll roll the hay up into a big uh, roll. And before that, they had the machines that put out the, the square bales at the thing. Before that, they had to just gather the hay up and, and put it, tie it in bundles and, and uh, uh, stack it in the middle of the field. The stubble, well, they just try to get rid of it anywhere they can. And all those are pictures of works that you can do, and people may say, oh, isn't that nice? But look, what is your motive for that work? You know, some people do good works just to be seen of other people. So other people will say, well, aren't they nice? They brought cookies to that old lady next door. Look, if you're going to take cookies to the lady next door, uh, make sure she knows that it's from the Lord Jesus Christ and you, and you love her in the Lord, and, you know, tell her a little scripture and let her know that you really, truly love her. And just don't bring her cookies. Go over and, uh, you know, vacuum her floor and clean her windows or, you know, just something, something every now and then to show that you love her. But just don't do something to make yourself... Most of this is to make you feel good in one way or another. Well, that's works of the flesh. And the Bible says they're going to go poof. 2 Timothy 4.14 talks about a guy named Alexander the coppersmith. Did me much evil, Paul said. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. Here's a guy who professed to be a Christian. Here's a guy that helped Paul down the road uh, hither uh, too. And then all of a sudden, he went against Paul. And he started arguing against Paul in court and got Paul in trouble. Uh, I've known Christians like that. They were my friends for a long time. All of a sudden, they don't like me. You know what happened? I told them the truth one day, probably, and they didn't like it. That's the problem with preachers. We lose more friends because of the truth. If you don't like the truth, don't make a preacher your friend. Because eventually, God's going to make him tell you the truth. <laughs> I remember your pappy, Brother Shiver. Um, I remember he told Brother Bill a few things one time. Some things Brother Bill didn't want to hear. And he came over to my house and said, I just had a meeting with Brother Shiver. And I said, well, Brother, you look troubled. He said, well, yeah, he told me some things. I said, you look like you really didn't want to hear what he had to say. He said, no. I looked at him and I said, Brother, I'm your friend, but I'm going to say this to you. I love you with all my heart. I said, did he tell you the truth? He said, yeah. I said, well, maybe you better listen. I happen to know what he told Brother Bill. Brother Bill wanted to quit the ministry. And he was bound to determine he was going to hit the road, Jack. And Brother Shiver said a few things to him. As an elder in the faith, it, 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 it kind of prickled him a little bit. But you know, when he got thinking about what was said, and after I said what I said, he went home, and about a week or two later, he said, thank you for praying for me. He said, well, how do you know? I said, how do you know I prayed for you? He said, you prayed for me. I said, yeah, you're right, I did. I said, you got, you got it settled, did you? He said, yep. I said, good. What you going to do now? He said, well, I'm praying that God will give me a new pulpit. You're looking at it right here. About a month or two later, Open Door Baptist Church came open. And he came there and we stayed. We stayed. I came with him. Now, pretty bad news. But there's one more piece of the puzzle. See, not only is God going to pay us for the good stuff we do for Him and reward us and get rid of... Now look, you're not going to burn up. All those works are going to burn up. You're going to be standing there, and if you've got nothing but wood, hay, and stubble, you'll be standing there with nothing when the fire is over with, okay? Save so is by fire. And you're going to be looking at like, whoops, what did I do? Uh, you, you, <laughs> it's too late to do anything about it then. You need to do it now. But there's some people that God has special rewards for, and they're called crowns. They're called crowns. Look at your sheet there. 
crowns under crowns. There's the pastor's crown. Those are for pastors who have been faithful in the work God called them to do. Whether they're a pastor of a big church, a little church, whether they've won a thousands and thousands to Christ or just one or two. God says be faithful. And if you're faithful in God's work and you try to glorify Him and your motive is good and you love Christ doing it, guess what? You're going to get a crown of some sort. 1 Peter 5, 4 And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory, which fadeth not away. And then you've got people who are endurers. Endurers. In other words, they, they've had a tough life. Every time they turn around, temptation, Satan, the flesh has just pounded them and pounded them and pounded them. Maybe they've got some terrible disease or maybe they've got some handicap or, or some kind of problem in their life and, 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 and it, it, it's tempting to them. And, and they, they keep resisting and they keep resisting and they keep resisting and they keep overcoming. James chapter 1 verse 12 says this, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive a crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. People sing, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, well, do you? Do you? And then there's the faithful crown. 2 Timothy 4, 8 says, Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but, to, but unto all them also, which love his appearing. You know what he said right before this verse? He said, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. This is given to someone that's faithful. So, I don't care if you're a Sunday school teacher. I don't care if you sit in the pew and just, uh, you know, sit there and pray and come all the time and, and try to, you know, do what you can as a Christian in the life that you have. Uh, you may get one of those faithful crowns. And look, when you look up in that sky and you see them clouds, what do you think of? I know what I think of. I say, Lord, there's a nice cloud. The Bible says he cometh with clouds. I said, Lord, don't you want to step on that cloud and come and call us home? Don't, don't you, uh, Lord, and, and on a day when there's no clouds, I said, God, there's clouds somewhere, somewhere. God, please come back. Every night when I go to bed, I said, Lord, please come back and get us. Now, I want to be relieved of pain. I want to uh, not, not have the trials and tribulations of this life. But, oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory. Let me lift my voice. Cares all past. Home at last. Ever to rejoice. Then if you've ever won anybody to Christ. You'll get a crown of rejoicing. And this one can't be taken away. Unless someone can get unsaved in this age, which I don't think they can. For what is our hope? Or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are ye not are, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? That's first Thessalonians two nineteen. Will there be any stars in my crown? In my crown? Will there be when the sun goeth down, will there be any stars in my crown? And then there's one. This is for people who run the race. Who get their head down. They learn what they can from God. Uh, and they're determined they're going to be the best Christian they can be. And the Bible calls that a race. Hebrews says well, there's a great cloud of witnesses. But 1 Corinthians 9.25 And every man that striveth for the masteries is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. After the fire is gone, 
after the residue is on the other side, God will make the crowns and God will start passing out the crowns. And the book of Revelation says in chapter 4 that he saw the four of the twenty elders casting their crowns at Jesus' feet. We don't even want to keep them. They belong to him anyway. It's just the fact that he gave them to us. Oh, this is going to be a day if you've lived for Christ. And finally, I want to talk about this fire. This fire that tries our works. Now, look very carefully what it says. It says, verse 13, 1 Corinthians 3, Every man's work shall be made manifest. Fire is a very revealing thing. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but um, very early criminologists uh, did not have a tool, but around the turn of the century they started to realize, uh, people like Madame Curie and, and different folks in Europe, uh, they started to understand that if you burn substances in a fire, that you could... Look at uh, this uh, with a with a uh, with a certain instrument, and you could see the the uh, chemicals and the elements in that fire to tell what was in a substance you were trying to test. That's what this fire does. It shows what you're made of. Um, you know, different chemicals in these things. Uh, they they uh, some of them uh, they they grow purple or they grow red or they glow. Uh, blue and and somebody that knows all these things can can differentiate what, what these things are made of and this is what goes on this fire shows and sorts out the things that are in our life for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is now if you go to first Timothy chapter 5, in verse 24, it says, Some men's sins are open beforehand. Look, there are people who sin on this earth and they get caught. Let's face it. There's been lots of Christians that have been caught doing this or that and the other. Oh, man. And, and of course, the newspapers and the news media love to gloat about, you know, oh, such and such and such got caught in doing this. And they just, they just dance around with glee when Christians are caught sinning, especially preachers. So some men's sins are open beforehand, going before the judgment. And some men they follow after. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand. And they that are otherwise cannot be hid. In other words, the Bible says that you may not get recognized on this earth for the good things you're doing and the things you're doing for God. But when you get there you will get recognized for what you've done. Now, you know what? We have very many famous Christians. Oh, got Billy Graham, Billy Sunday, uh, Moody. You know, you got um, uh, people that, uh, the guy who founded the Liberty University and just all kinds of uh, famous Christians. Uh, you got them on TV all the time. Uh, uh, Billy Graham's son and this guy that, uh, oh, I see his little face. Uh, I can't think of his name. He's on Fox all the time. And those are very, man, people says, well, what a good guy that is, what good work he does. And, and you know, they do good, good works. But we're going to be surprised when we get to heaven and that fire goes through people's works. We're going we're gonna to see some little old lady or some little kid that uh, nobody knows uh, or, or some man in the church that, uh, you know, he just comes and goes and, and nobody really realizes who he is or, or what he's doing. And, and you're going to find that he, he's been the power behind the throne. He's the one that's prayed for the preacher. The little old lady was the one that, that prayed and, you know, slipped the dollar in the preacher's pocket to encourage him and, and and uh, this little person over here, uh, you know, he went out and sold Coke bottles and gave a bunch to missions or something that nobody knew about. And, and you're going to find God's celebrities are not the same celebrities that we have on this planet. And all those things are going to be sorted out. All these things are going to be sorted out. Our works are going to be accounted for. Now, I don't know how long this is going to take. Uh, 
when we get to heaven, time doesn't mean anything. And uh, the Bible does say these works are going to be manifest. Um, but I'm sure God's going to ask us about things. Look, if you've done something wrong and it's a sin, you better get that confessed right now. Because if you don't, God's going to call you up there and say, now what about this thing? You did this. You knew it was wrong. You never confessed it to me. You never, you never got it under the blood. What about that thing? And he's going to ask you to give an account for that thing. I don't know about you, but that terrifies me. Now, I've known some Christians that were so hard-hearted, they tell me, well, that's not a problem. Really? Wait till you look to Jesus Christ in the eyes and tell, then tell me that's not a problem. Some people have been brainwashed by Hollywood and TV and magazines and books and stuff. They don't, they don't have a real sense of reality. This is reality, folks. Romans 14, 12 says, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Every one of us. And then, of course, our works are going to be tested by fire. What we do in God's will for God and for His glory is fireproof. Absolutely fireproof. Second. Corinthians 5, Colossians chapter 4. Let's read that first. Epaphras, he was an old saint, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Epaphras was worried about those people back in Corinth. He was praying for them that they did the will of God. That when they stood before God, not only did they give them a good account and they were perfect, but they gave them a complete account. I'm afraid some Christians have a real problem. And I'm probably among them. I, I confess a lot before the Lord. I, I mess up a lot. Um... I don't, I don't feel very holy myself. Um, I'm very hard on myself, and I'm that way on purpose. I'd rather be that way and have the Lord said, well, that was okay what you confessed. I would rather have the Lord say that than get it to heaven and say, well, you should have confessed that, and you didn't. Err on the side of caution. Err on the side of caution. Matter of fact, when I was a young Christian, I used to have a list of all these things like in Galatians chapter 5. And every night when I went to bed, I would, I would take those lists and I would confess everything on them lists. And I was like a 15-year-old kid. I didn't even know what some of them things were. I confessed them anyway, just in case. I, I, I don't know about you, but I want to be... I want to be good when I stand before the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Wherefore we labor that whether we, uh, whether absent, uh, present or absent. I'll get this straight in a minute. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You got that, everybody? That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to, to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. We are told in the Bible of Dorcas. And about her great deeds of charity in the Bible. How she made the garments and helped people out. And when she died, they stood there and they mourned for her, not merely weeping, but showing the garments that she had made them out of the love of her heart. Have you thought about that at all? How that the work that we put out means something to somebody? Our time our strength, our talent. Could that be exhibited after we're gone as a credit to us after we're gone? What if it had been Battenberg doilies or hand-painted throws for the drawing room to which Dorcas had devoted her spare time? 
however artistic they might have been, they would have seemed tawdry and trifling in such an hour as those simple garments she made to keep people warm and to swath the baby and to make sure someone had some clothing and not go around naked. The homely garments were beautiful because of the beautiful spirit of self-denial and love in which they were wrought. Sometimes we say we wish to be remembered by what we have done. Do we? The nearest approach to immortality that we can know in this changing world is impressing oneself upon the hearts of our brethren. Because the Lord's keeping track of the rest of it. So I want to say to you, we're going to stand before that great and marvelous day. Romans 14.10 in conclusion. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Some people are good at that. Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Philippians 4.1 Therefore my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. If you stand now for the Lord, you won't have a problem when you stand in that other place. Over Nottingham, England, you know, the famous... Sheriff of Nottingham and all like that. There's a museum that stands. In 1375, it was called the King's Hall. Uh, it was where all the records were kept. And if you committed a crime or you were married or you sold a piece of property, that's where the Norman rulers of the time had appointed the Sheriff's Hall and the Sheriff's Record and made sure that uh, he kept order. They were the keepers of peace and the collectors of the taxes. It was also used as a prison. If you were arrested, you were tried there, and you were sentenced there, and the sentence was carried out there. Many, many people were executed in the courtyard of the King's Hall. The first time... Um, that someone died, we don't know. We know when the last person was publicly executed. There was 1864. And that then uh, public executions were outlawed in England. In 1905, a new police station was built next door. And this became, became a museum in 1995 after renovation. It became a symbol of English justice. People can go through those hallways and they can look at what judges thought and what they looked like and what the kind of sentences were and what kind of punishments were meted out. What good people got in return for good works and what evil people got in return for evil works. We have places like this in the United States. You can go to Washington, D.C. and go through a very similar place. You can go downtown in Pensacola and probably see some historical stuff. So why is it good to see those things? Because we need to be reminded that even though we live in a free country and even though we have freedom of religion and all that wonderful liberties that the Bill of Rights gives us, we have some responsibilities not only as citizens but as Christians also. And that one day we will stand before the king. We'll not only see the king, we're going to talk to the king. We're going to be judged by the king. And it behooves me as a Christian preacher to remind you of these things on occasion. Because I don't want any of you to go through your life thinking that, well, it's all by grace and everything's just going to be free and we don't have to. We have a lot of responsibility before the Lord. Now, it doesn't save us, doesn't keep us saved. But if you want to stand before God, if you want to have that inheritance in the millennium, if you want to, uh, you know, ha ha be truly blessed in eternity, and people recognize you as a, a saint of God and somebody that's done something for God, keep this in mind. And not only will keep you out of trouble, 
but it may remind you that the things you do are not for me or for you or anybody else, but ultimately they're for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the question I have for you tonight is do you love him? Do you want to please him? And are you ready to stand before him tonight if he came back? If not, well, I would go home, I'd find you a closet somewhere, a quiet place, run out in the woods, and me and you uh, and God uh, have a prayer, prayer meeting, you and God, me and God, everybody and God, just by yourself, and get things straightened up. You say, well, I got a lot of back things to confess. Well, take your time. Take your time. And look, if you truly have forgotten stuff, I do believe in grace. And I believe if you truly have a repentant heart and you want to please God, I do believe God sometimes just forgives people of groups of things. I think God's done that for me in the past. You say, Brother Jeff, uh, you've had days and, and weeks when, uh, yeah, I have, just like everybody else. See, I have this too. Just don't let it get the advantage of you, folks. You rule it, don't let it rule you. And when we stand before that seat and all of it's over with and the crowns are passed out and we get to go to the wedding feast of the Lamb, we'll sit down and we'll be glad that we live for God. And we'll have a happy, good time. And look, if you do see some poor saint that's lost everything, I know you won't be mean to him. You'll have a heart of grace and a heart of love just like Jesus. I'll go up to him in heaven and say, tough luck, old fella. Here's some of mine. God, don't say anything about giving it away once you get there. Amen? Because I do love the brethren. And I, I, I mourn for some of them. Heavenly Father, help us. I need to quit talking and go home, God. Lord, this is a big subject. And God, there's many, many things I could preach on. God, help us as we look to you every day. Help us to get up in the morning and look at the new day and purpose in our heart that we're going to live for you. And God, every night when we lay our head down on the pillow, help us to review the day and, and think about the things we've done. And, and God, if there's things we need to confess to you, if there's things we need to pray about, help us to do that and lay them in your hands, God. So that the day comes, God, when you come and get us and that we can stand before you. And it won't be a time of weeping and crying and gnashing of teeth and, and remorse, but it'll be a time of rejoicing. And if we have a few things that burn up, we'll be glad to see them go and we'll have a lot of other things we get to keep. Bless us now as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.